So we're just about to start. Welcome everyone to the uh, latest in, uh, in the ANS licensing uh, webinar series. We have uh, with us today, uh, as usual, our regular guest, uh, Baden Appleyard. Hello, Baden. Hello, Baden. We do. Well, we used to have Baden with us. Hey, Adrian, how are you doing? Oh, yep. Baden is here. That's good. Um, all fine up there in uh, sunny Brisbane, uh, Baden? It's, it's yet another delightful day in Queensland, Adrian. Good. It's excellent. And uh, from, we'll hear a little bit more from Baden about uh, some developments in Osgol a, a little bit later. Uh, we have a special guest today, uh, Dr. Kevin Cullen. Hi, Kevin. Hello. So Kevin's here because uh, we uh, have an interest in um, the broader aspects of intellectual property and uh, how that uh, impacts on, on licensing. And uh, Kevin is from uh, New South Innovations. Uh, that's uh, based at the University of New South Wales. Is that correct, uh, Kevin? That's correct, yep. And would it be correct to say that's the, the sort of knowledge transfer arm of the university? The, yes, it is. Uh, yeah. Good. And um, just where we sort of see that fitting in, because, you know, this is a, a forum where we talk about all things uh, licensing, open access, um, particularly to do with data. But, you know, we, Baden and I, never limit ourselves in the broad ranging conversations that we we have. Uh, however, in order to license something, you've got to know, you know, who owns it and, you know, where does it, who has the ability to license things and you know, licensing fits in a broader um, intellectual property kind of framework. Um, and the licensing around data in particular uh, has its, you know, its own uh, little um, you know, significant qualities that, that uh, Make it a, a, a particular um, area. However, it, you know it, it can't be seen as you know divorced from that, that larger context. So uh, Kevin's joining us today, and hopefully he'll talk to us about some terrific uh, innovative stuff that's happening at the uh, New South Innovations. Uh, Kevin, I believe, how long have you been with the New South Innovations, Kevin? Uh, Eighteen months. Eighteen months. And so it's still new. Yeah, as the CEO, is that right? That's correct, yep. And uh, previous I, to I'm that, not from around here, you might have guessed that. Yes, I was going to say previous to that, you seem to have picked up an accent from somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I was at the University of Glasgow doing this for 11 years before I came to Sydney. Okay, and what was that as, uh, in the research office world, is that right, of the University yeah, of Glasgow? Yeah, uh, I was Director of Research and Enterprise, which was the sort of research administration and tech transfer part of oh. the University of Glasgow. Terrific. Oh, that's good. Um, so I believe you have a, uh, some slides in the presentation for us. Is that right? Um, yep. we'll, we'll cross over to those in a, in, in a sec. Um, after that, we will have uh, some time for uh, questions and answers. A bit of discussion around uh, the, the issues that uh, Kevin raises. We'll uh, a little bit later have a, a, an update from Baden as well. So lots of interesting things uh, for our discussion today. Uh, just to give you an idea, today we've got lots of around 20, 25 people participating directly in the, the webinar. If you're listening or watching this at a later date in the future, um, consider joining the webinars live. They're all on the, it uh, gives you the chance to participate and uh, ask questions and give us some ideas as well. We've got people from, uh, mostly from universities uh, around Australia, uh, Canberra University, uh, ANU, QUT, lots of people. I'm just skimming through our, our guest list here. Um, UQ, Western Australia, so really from all around Australia. Uh, we have a couple of people from public sector organisations uh, in the different states around Australia, so uh, a broad range of people uh, involved. If anyone is uh, in the audience and wants to ask a question, there is a little chat um, module that you'll see on the, the little uh, GoToMeeting um, 
window. So if you just type something in there, then uh, we can um, uh, we'll get to that question when we get to the dis discussion part. If you have a, a microphone, we can always uh, cross to you as well to get the questions. Um, let's go to uh, Kevin's presentation now. We'll just do a little technology handshake here. Looks like we're right. Yes, we can see your screen there, Kevin. Very good. So I now have control. Yes. Ha <laughs> ha. Although Baden and I will do our best to uh, derail that, but. Uh... <laughs> All right. So I'll just take it from here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm, as it says on the screen, Kevin Cullen. I've been at UNSW for eight. 18 months. I've been doing tech transfer for 18 years. Um, one of those pesky tech transfer people who, when you go around the world, seem to get the blame for all the, the failings of the economy. Um, and today I'm going to talk about Easy Access IP, which is an initiative that, that we have developed to, to try and make the, the flow of knowledge more efficient and effective. Um, I'm going to spend most time talking about the, the sort of philosophical underpinnings for it uh, and I'll set the context by saying it was developed for you know classical technology transfer patents and licensing and IP and all that but I think the, the, the logic and the philosophy behind it apply in just about all areas of university activity uh, whether those are ideas or data or uh, software or whatever. Um, I'll just launch into it I, and as I said having been doing this for a long long time I got to the point of having to ask the, the very fundamental question what is tech transfer for? Um, it seems like a, a, a fairly naive question to have to ask yourself after doing it for 18 years but what I discovered was depending who you spoke to and when you spoke to them you'd actually have different views. Um, some people believe that university tech transfer commercialization is about making money for the university uh, to generate revenues to, to make academics rich and to reinvest in research, teaching, facilities, etc. Uh, some people, especially academics, um, think that tech transfer is there to help them to achieve their research objectives. Um, and other people, usually economic development agencies and governments and politicians and policymakers, think that tech transfer is an economic development activity which should be creating jobs and improving the economy and society around us. Um, and as I say, depending who you were speaking to and where you were speaking to them, you, you'd often get one or a mixture of all three of these. And I came to the conclusion eventually that it's actually none of these. None of these is the reason why we do technology transfer. And why we do tech transfer is actually to help the university to achieve its mission. And the, the university mission is, in my simplistic understanding, to create and disseminate knowledge. Um, I, I've now made that statement to thousands and thousands of people and no one has actually ever disagreed um, I think everyone's on mute here, so you probably don't get a chance to disagree, but you can disagree with me later on. Yeah. Um, the university exists to create and disseminate knowledge. The knowledge creation bit is relatively simple um, in that it's research, and we all understand research, and we know how it's funded, and how it's assessed, and how it's measured, and, and all these different things. Um, the knowledge dissemination part of the university's mission is in my view sort of split across three different areas. The one that dominates at the moment probably is publication I, and this is the university disseminating its knowledge through the in the form of publications usually to other scientists or other researchers or other people who can use uh, the research outputs to go and do something useful with them uh, to build upon them. Teaching is another big one. That's where the university takes its knowledge and puts it into the heads of students so they can take the university's knowledge and go and do something useful with it. And I argue that knowledge transfer, commercialization, tech transfer, whatever it's called this week, is simply another mechanism, another conduit through which this dissemination happens. Um, in the same way as publication puts it into people's hands to use it and teaching puts it into people's heads to use it, tech transfer is just another mechanism by which to get the knowledge into the hands of someone 
somewhere who can do, go and do something useful with it. In this case, it's usually business, industry, entrepreneurs, but it can also be uh, policy makers, public servants, politicians, etc. And I'll, I'll show you my diagram. Um, I've been using this for many years now. I drew it one afternoon in a, in a fit of frustration at my inability to understand what the hell I was trying to do um, and what was going to make it work. And it, forgive the formatting, it's, it's a little bit off, but hopefully you'll, you'll understand. Um, we do research. The primary outputs of research are new knowledge and new and better researchers, and we all get that. These manifest themselves in all these different things, publications, processes, IP, know-how, skills, innovation. And we as universities create these in industrial quantities. You know, we at UNSW do $300 million worth of research per annum, and we create loads and loads and loads of this stuff, uh, which sort of gets counted by people in herdic returns and all, all these different surveys. It then comes into my world, the tech transfer world, the knowledge exchange commercialization world, and in this box, you can see all the different activities that we as universities and research organizations undertake every day of the week, um, be it consultancy, professional training, collaborative research, contract research, licensing, spin-outs, all of these things that we do based upon the knowledge that's created in the university. And the, the thing that they all have in common is that they are simply conduits, they're channels through which the, the university's knowledge flows to these people on the other side of the box. The startups spin out, small companies, big companies, society, government, policy makers, the people who make use of our knowledge to go and create these things that everyone wants to see happen, all the impacts, um, jobs, products, processes, investment in R&D, all the things that the policymakers and politicians desperately want to see coming out of the universities, these impacts. And as you know, we last year uh, conducted an impact pilot in Australia, uh, followed on from an impact pilot in the UK, which was looking at what research has done to create impacts in the world outside the, the academy. I, and we, we came up with all sorts of case studies and stories and examples. The, the thing that struck me about the exercise, though, was the fact that these impacts are created by the research users. Um, it, it's really tricky because I don't know exactly who's on the line, but I've got myself into trouble before uh, by saying the problem is that universities don't actually create impacts. Um, universities' key role is to help other people to create these impacts. Because what we are doing is we're trying to get the research from the left-hand end into the hands of the research users so they can create impact. But the tech transfer function in the university isn't the place that creates these impacts. Um, I, I, and that has some implications for what we're trying to do and the way in which we're doing it. So this model, um, th this diagram of mine, as I say, I've been using for many years because I think it explains a number of things. It, it shows that tech transfer isn't a linear process. It's actually a complex, chaotic system um, which operates over years, if not decades. That research at the left-hand end does feed into impact at the right-hand end. However, the, the route by which it gets there is chaotic. When you do the research, you have no means at all of predicting what the impact is going to be or how it's going to be achieved because it has to go through all these different routes, sometimes iterating back and forth over years and decades before it will eventually end up as an impact. Uh, and that, I, I think, has implications for policymakers as well because every now and again you have these, these pushes towards having more directed research, um, impact directed research. And in actual fact, that, that just doesn't work. Um, so some points that, that I'd note. We, as the university, we doing tech transfer, we're part of a complex system. Uh, tech transfer fits within the university's overall mission as part of the dissemination machinery. And I think that's actually quite important 
because over the, the 18 years I've been doing this, I, I've heard people talk about commercialization as a new mission of the university, um, a, as a third leg to the university's objectives alongside research and teaching, a, and I think that's a mistake. A, I, I think that's a wrong way of looking at it. Because when looked at through the lens of <clears throat> university knowledge dissemination, what you begin to see is instead of being a new uncomfortable thing being bolted onto the back end of the university, tech transfer is in actual fact a fundamental part of why universities exist. I don't think you can be a proper university unless you're doing technology oblique knowledge transfer to get the university's knowledge out and put to use. Uh, we have a role to play in helping to achieve impact from university research, and that's important because everyone wants to see impact. However, we need external partners to make that happen. We as the university don't create the products, we don't create the jobs, it's the companies, it's the entrepreneurs, it's our partners who, who actually go and create these. Our job, my job, is in optimizing these channels. I mean, back to the diagram, in that rectangular box, those channels through which knowledge flows are things that we as a university have a degree of control over. We can make them easier or harder. We can make them faster or slower. We can make them more expensive or less expensive. So, so we can play a very important role in optimizing the flow of knowledge into the hands of users. Um, but that's really what the job is, rather than trying to create the impact ourselves. And over the years, the, the licensing part, the licensing of intellectual property has been viewed as difficult. And it, it's really quite interesting, go anywhere on the planet and you will hear exactly the same war stories and the same horror stories, uh, usually from people in industry, but these are also stories that have been told to the policymakers and the politicians. They say, university is difficult to work with, uh, intellectual property, oh, it's all too hard. Um, university is really, really bad at this, and licensing is seen as something incredibly difficult. Um, so we decided to take a step back and challenge this and, and adopt a different approach to licensing of intellectual property. And we call it Easy Access IP. Uh, hopefully it does what it says on the tin. Um, and it really started from the position that the university's mission is to create and disseminate knowledge. And we aim to transfer as much IP into usage as we can to create benefits for our partners, community, society, and the economy. So you'll notice there isn't a dollar sign or a pound sign or a yen sign in that mission. It's not about making money. It's about maximizing the flow of university research outputs into use to maximize benefits for the community at large. And the, the, adopt, the approach we've adopted is that whilst all IP has inherent value, we, we believe that, we're a university, of course knowledge has inherent value, but only a small proportion has significant commercial potential, only a small proportion has significant financial value to the university. And for that small proportion of intellectual property where you can see an obvious route to making money from it, we will seek to exploit it through the, the traditional commercialization routes, spin out companies, uh, high value licenses, um, seeking to, to maximize the, the income from that small proportion of IP. However, for the other IP, the IP where frankly we can't see a route, an immediate route to making a million dollars from it, we've decided that we will seek to transfer it for free to partners who can tell us how they're going to use it to create some sort of social or economic benefit. I concluded, we concluded that the current model is inefficient and expensive. And just as background, I've been Vice President for Metric Surveys and Statistics for the US-based Tech Transfer Association, AUTM for the UK-based association, for the European-based association, and now the Australasian-based association. So I've seen the stats, I've seen the numbers that shows that the, uh, the vast majority of intellectual property never makes any money. Only a very small proportion makes significant sums. Um, however, the tech transfer model that has evolved over the years has a tendency to treat all IP as if it is valuable that it might be valuable, and let's treat it as if it's valuable, 
um, until we can demonstrate otherwise. And what that's tended to do is to turn every tech transfer office into a weird broad-based product development organization because we've got, what, about 100 invention disclosures per annum. And if your starting position is that every one of these might be the billion dollar idea, then you've got a responsibility to develop those hundred ideas, to, to treat them as if they're valuable and to, to try and create more value from them, to try and identify where the value is going to come from. That's a hundred inventions per annum that we're getting across things as diverse as material science, quantum computing, software, divinity, uh, the medical faculty, all sorts of stuff, uh, and I don't, have, don't know about anyone else on the line, but I don't think that we as a tech transfer office have the skill set to be able to do that justice. Um, I don't think there's any organization on the planet that has the skill set to be able to do that development. And remember, that's 100 per annum. Once you have those multiplying over years, you'll be sitting, as we are, with something like 400 projects, 400 pieces of intellectual property. And if the expectation is that we're going to do a, a thorough job of developing and seeking to exploit every single one of those, um, I think you're doomed to failure. And the fact of the matter is that 95% of licensing income comes from 5% of IP. That's what the stats say, and it doesn't matter whether you're in this part of the world or you're in the US or Europe, the numbers are always the same. The IP income comes from big wins, big uh, sort of lottery ticket wins. And the weird thing is that the 5% the of IP that's most valuable tends to be the easiest to do deals on. Um, because when everyone recognizes that the IP is valuable, you tend to be in a professional negotiating scenario. Uh, the people that you're negotiating with see the value, you see the value, and whilst not simple, it's relatively straightforward to be able to come to some sort of agreement, some sort of deal. Um, it's the IP where you don't know what the value is and you can't see a route to commercialization that tends to cause me, in my experience, all of the difficulties. Um, if you can't see the route to commercialization, if you don't know what it's worth, and yet you're trying to negotiate a licensing deal with someone else, uh, you find yourself in this bizarre um, dialogue of the death where you don't know and they don't know, and so you're negotiating over something where neither side knows what the, the value is. Uh, and what tends to happen is that we set a price that's considered too high. Um, we're always being criticized for overvaluing technology. We're always being criticized for being difficult to negotiate with. Um, I have to admit over the years that I've been concerned that there's sometimes a, a bit of a culture of greed and fear in the, the tech transfer world. That we're terrified that we are not going to get a sufficient return from the technology. Um, and so we're always pushing for higher and higher and higher uh, values on the IP. Um, and, and that tends to alienate uh, potential partners. So we, we've got licensing of IP basically creating obstacles to the flow of knowledge. And what that means is that knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange is not happening. Um, the licensing process has become an obstacle to the flow of knowledge. And that, if you think back to my first couple of slides, is the very, very worst thing because our job, our mission, is to disseminate knowledge. And if tech transfer becomes viewed as an obstacle to the flow of knowledge, then what you've got is a part of the organization that's operating counter to the mission of your employer. And I don't know about anyone else, but that, for me, isn't a comfortable place to be uh, because it can have career-limiting implications. So we concluded that the process of commercializing the top 5 to 10% of IP is relatively straightforward and does generate returns. If you've got high value IP, you can license it and you can make money from it. We all like these, they work pretty well. Um, when you do a good spin out company or you do a high value license, everyone ends up reasonably happy. It's the process of commercializing the rest of the IP that's difficult, expensive and doesn't generate returns. So we said, you know what, let's just remove that obstacle and let's give that IP away for free. 
Um, we concluded that license negotiations, when they happen at all, because most IP that's generated from universities, you never get into a licensing negotiation, you never have interest from industry at all. Uh, when you do get uh, interest from industry, the potential value is unclear, the required development costs are unclear, and everyone starts fighting with each other over what value they're going to add, what value they're going to create, and what the relative returns are going to be. And what that tends to do is to, to put the relationship on a negative footing right from the start. Um, you and the company, you and the research user, are on opposite sides of the table beating each other up over the value of this intellectual property, which in reality we all know that no one knows what the value is. So we decided that with easy access IP, relationships start out positively. We are saying we want you, research user, to be a partner, to take our intellectual property, to take our research outputs and do something wonderful with them. Um, if you go and make a huge amount of money, that's fantastic. We will applaud, celebrate, and uh, look for an ongoing relationship with you. And the thing is as well, that when you're giving the IP away for free, the company will usually want to sustain and grow the relationship. Um, most companies understand that working the IP without the inventor is virtually impossible. And therefore, you've got the scope to be able to introduce all sorts of other knowledge transfer channels, back to that rectangular box again, consultancy, ARC linkages, student placement, student employment, training for the company, all these mechanisms that we have in place for working with companies that tend not to have the negative baggage that tends to be associated with licensing. And also we concluded that these relationships with the research users are the ones that will lead to ongoing relationships, ongoing research, and those are the ones that will lead to the big wins in the future. And most importantly, it's getting the university's knowledge out there to be used. It's achieving, it's in line with, it's helping with the university's mission. Uh, we don't give it away for free by throwing in a skip in the middle of the quadrangle and letting people just scoop it up. It's a one-page license agreement. Um, the company has to commit to create benefits from the intellectual property. They have to tell us how they're going to use it, what they're going to do with it, what the benefits are going to be. They can't impede our ability to do research in that area. Uh, they've got a three-year exclusive license in which to demonstrate that they've done something. At the end of three years, if they've done something, I'll assign the IP to them for free. Otherwise, I reserve the right to take it back. And number four is I think the most important one. The company has to agree to acknowledge the university's contribution in the successful exploitation of the intellectual property. So what we're doing is we're moving from a finance-driven model to a reputation-driven model. Um, giving IP for free to people who will hopefully create benefits from it and then we get the reputational boost from being associated with lots and lots of successful commercialization. And we reckon that the, the trade-off in terms of reputation versus potential income from the IP turns out very positively. Um, anyone who's heard me speak, I always come to the, the fact that while in the business world reputation follows money, in the university sector money follows reputation. So if you have a reputation for doing excellent research, uh, that's relevant to the outside world and you're good to do business with, then you will attract the best staff, the best students and the best research partners. And that's what drives universities and that's what success looks like for universities. And it's also about challenging the demand side. I'm sick and tired of the university being blamed for the lack of flow of knowledge into industry. Um, industry always says, oh, the universities, they make it too difficult, they over-negotiate, they overvalue. Um, we're now saying, you know what, we are removing those obstacles. We've removed the price question, we've removed the bureaucracy question. So how about industry, you now step up and come and work with us. Um, we're finding that's working. So far, um, we've had a very positive response from virtually all communities. Um, we've done nine easy access deals on 15 technologies. I think that might now actually be 11 and 19. Uh, we have received a significant increase in the number of companies coming to speak to us about working with us. Uh, and we saw this as a key indicator from the outset. Whether they come and speak to us about 
the IP that's available for free or they just want to speak to us about the model that we're developing or they want to come and speak to us about research. Those are the conversations that will drive knowledge transfer going forward. Getting more companies speaking to more researchers is a, is a primary measure of what we're trying to do. Uh, we're seeing research opportunities develop. Uh, we've refreshed, uh, that's a euphemism obviously, relationships with existing partners, um, companies that we had relationships with who were really quite unhappy um, because they felt that every opportunity the tech transfer office was trying to screw them over for money, money, money. Um, the response from the business community has been very positive and I, I think we have established ourselves as a university that wants to do business with business. Entrepreneurs are now coming to speak to us, students are coming to speak to us, business is coming to speak to us about ways in which we can work together and ultimately that's what our job is because that's the mechanism through which knowledge is going to flow out into use. Um, it's an experiment. Uh, I did my PhD in physical organic chemistry, so I am an experimentalist at heart. Uh, just seeing what happens when you remove all the obstacles, when you remove all the things that people say are causing the problems, does this result in an increased flow of knowledge? Because really only one of two things can happen. Uh, either nothing happens and that proves that all these obstacles that people pointed to in terms of overvaluation and over negotiation weren't the real problem at all, they were just symptoms or excuses, or we're going to see much more IP being put to use by companies, leading to innovation, economic growth and all these other impacts that we were talking about earlier. And we think we've struck the right balance, a commercial approach to a small proportion of valuable IP, easy access IP for the rest, getting more knowledge put to use, it reduces our costs, increases the amount of knowledge flowing, and it lets business get to work on creating value from the intellectual property rather than spend months and months and months negotiating with us. It's helped raise our profile. Um, I would like to think it's putting the, the university sector into a positive light that we are seen as trying to make things happen, trying to, to address issues that people talk about and that is going to create value and be seen to, to help the economy. And I'll finish there and thank you for listening. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Kevin. That's an absolutely inspiring uh, overview of the the work happening there, and particularly the your you know attitude there that you know the real goal in this uh, process is for the knowledge to be used, um, and that all the you know the licensing or the um, different technology transfer things that we use are, are sort of means to that goal, and that's really been able to. I think you know, let you have a you know, not a revolutionary approach, but, but certainly a refreshing approach. And we're into the discussion part of our um, little webinar today. We've got a question uh, coming from Kathy Miller. We might try and get Kathy's uh, microphone up. Um, just a reminder to anyone who's on the call today: uh, there is a little question module. Uh, we'll, uh, where you can write in a question and um, that will allow you to participate in the discussion. So, uh, Cathy, can uh, can you hear me and uh, can we hear you is the second question. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. What was your question, Cathy? Excellent. <laughs> I just wanted to um, thank you, Kevin, first for a really clear talk. That was great. I think I already know the answer to my question. I'm just wondering if the model that you're working with extends at all to licensing research data to other research institutions or researchers who can make use of it in their research? Uh, yes. Um, I, I, I can't see any reason why that wouldn't happen. In actual fact, we have done a couple of easy access IP licenses to other research institutions. We've actually licensed IP and technology to other universities, so I can't see why that wouldn't be the case for research data as well. Okay, yeah. thanks very much. Oh, thanks, Cathy. Uh, yeah, Kevin, just on that, uh, could you give us an idea of what, what, what kind of, uh, they're not objects, but let's just pretend they were objects. Uh, if I were to work into, uh, walk into the 
Easy IP shop at UNSW. What, what kind of objects is it that? Uh, what, what kind of objects are they that you're, um, you know, making available to people? You know, the technology. But if you could give us an example, what do you mean? Yeah, it's a diverse range of things. The first Easy Access IP deal that we did over here was a piece of software. It was an algorithm. Um, for predicting the flow of wind um, over geographical surfaces. And this was licensed to a company that's in the business of designing wind farms. Um, they, they obviously have an interest in being able to monitor and predict what the wind speed is going to be at any given time based upon uh, the geographical terrain that they're on and the weather forecast. I, and for me, this was a classic. I mean, how do you commercialize that? We've absolutely no idea what the value would be. And so what we did was we licensed it to this company, and they're now building that algorithm into uh, the design of wind farms that they, they sell commercially. Um, uh, and we are continuing to do work with them in terms of developing research based upon that piece of work. Uh, but there's everything from those sorts of algorithms through what's called the Beatbox, which is uh, a code name Heart Esky. It, it's a, a a little device for keeping donor organs viable for longer. Um, a, apparently, the the biggest cause of organ donation failure is that the organ doesn't get to the the transplantee soon enough. Um, and what we've got is something that will keep hearts and livers and kidneys and everything viable for much, much longer. So e everything from a spark plug for a scramjet through the beatbox, through the, the wind prediction algorithm. Um, if you do a, a Google search on UNSW Easy Access IP, it will take you straight to the list. I think we've got about 12 up on the list at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the latest one that went up that I thought was really cool was a, a device that goes inside a helmet that simulates movement. Uh, so it gives you the feeling that your head is moving despite the fact that it isn't. So if you think of applications for that in, in things like interactive gaming, etc., that, that's got a lot of potential. But we can't see a route to commercializing it, making a million dollars. Um, right off the bat. So what we're doing is seeking a partner who'll be able to come along and develop that with us and turn it into a useful product. Good. All right. So then uh, to get back to uh, to circle back again to Kathy's question, uh, do you think this framework that you've got that sort of relies on, a, on an assumption that 95% of the IP is actually more valuable when it's used than than you know, when it's tried to be negotiated over. Do you think that has an application to the, the data outputs of, um, of re research at the, at the university? And has that ever come through your office yet? Or? No, it hasn't come through our office. But mm -hmm. you know, I can't see any practical or philosophical reason why you couldn't apply exactly the same approach to, to data sets. Yeah, well, certainly the, it's the it's your approach which is really refreshing. That sort of says, okay, let's turn this around and say that it's far more efficient for us to get stuff being used. And in our sort of particular focus, it's about you know data. Um, yeah. So you know, and we assume that the, the, you know, again, we'll just assume that your figures uh, kind of apply across to the data field. That ninety five percent of it is you know actually. Uh, the idea of licensing is it is not necessarily to stop people from using it, but the reason why we'd want to apply a license to data is to to give people confidence that they can use it. So kind yeah. of turning yeah. the licensing thing on its head by saying by doing this we're we're providing clarity and ease and um, less friction in the system uh, you know, and a, a quicker path to reuse. So I really like your model, and I I, I think it you know it, it certainly looks like it has an application over at the, at the data side of the outputs. Yeah, and it's also you know challenging the potential users to tell you what they're going to do with it. Mm. Uh, because that, that's the number one condition that we apply. You can't just have this IP for free. You have to tell us what you're going to do with it, what you're going to use it for. Um, mm. And so having that clarity and, as you say, the permission to use it, yeah, it sounds good. Mm. Perhaps the, the data world, anyway, we would have to see how it applies there, but the data world is probably slightly more open 
even than that, in that um, we want to kind of proactively get the stuff out there and say, look, if you've got a use for this, uh, be you know, rest assured that it's it's open. The the terms of use are clear, and um, you know, we usually go for you know, a kind of an attribution requirement that says that when it is used, then you know, it will need to be um, attri attributed. Uh, what, yeah. How does uh, uh, what I was just going to ask a question about collaboration. Baden, feel free, is Baden's mic on? Yep. Feel free to chime in whenever you want, Baden. Um, but the the question about collaboration, what what value do you put on the on the uh, you know does the university I mean, you know not a monetary value, but you know how important it is is it in the kind of out the measuring of your outputs that you've been able to increase collaborative opportunities. Uh, that's the key performance indicator. When, when I arrived, I mean, our office was like many tech transfer offices where what was counted, what, what performance was measured on was number of disclosures, number of patents, number of licenses and royalty income. Uh, we've changed that round to say what we now see is important is the, the extent of engagement between the university and the outside world and the growth of the university's overall research business. I mean, su success for us is more IP being used by these partners, leading to collaborative opportunities and collaborative research, leading to a growth in the research portfolio of the university. Uh, that's when UNSW is happy. We've got some questions here from Catherine uh, Baden. Anything before I go to uh, Catherine for her question? Look, um yeah, thanks, Adrian. I think there's a couple of things uh, that come out of uh, Kevin's talk, and I'm really glad uh, we were able to grab him to to come in and uh, share this on a webinar. Um, if I go back five or six years, probably seven years, or even eight years, and I look at the work that was done by the Queensland government when they were developing the GILF, the GILF framework, the Government Information Licensing Framework, uh, a lot of research was done as to how information was handled in the Queensland government and how it was licensed and, and what was licensed. And it's it's ironic that very similar figures came out of that report as as what Kevin has realised there. I mean, in those days, the Queensland government, I, I suppose it was probably a little bit more rudimentary back then than perhaps one could do now, but about 80 80 20 was the position that the Queensland government took about information that could be openly licensed. And remember, we're talking about information there, not necessarily data specifically. But um, about 80 20. And, and that's one of the reasons why the Ausgol framework uh, has endured through to this day, because it's the proposition, I think, that could be made for all governments. In fact, almost a lot of organisations, in fact. Um, so I, I highlight the similarity of what the what uh, Kevin's found here to the position that that we took in in developing the GILF uh, framework many years ago. But that said, I think a lot of similarities come out of what uh, Kevin had said. I think if if I just change the odd word here or there, I could make the same presentation around open access to government data and open access to government information. I mean, um, uh, even down to things like value. And what we're seeing now. Uh, is almost all of the economists agreeing that unlike everything else that we value in society, and even even small children uh, take this view, that, that scarcity is the primary motivating factor for establishing value. You know, it happens in the schoolyard. You can't have this because it's mine, and because it's mine, I have a greater value um, I have uh, the ability to leverage the value of that thing. And that's been happening for years in government, it's been happening for years in university, but what we're seeing now is economic uh, realisation that in fact if you open <coughs> things up, that's when you increase the value. Gesundheit, Greg. Um, <laughs> so, Baden, you know, uh, so, surely you're not um, you know, uh, hinting that uh, government departments uh, behave like children in a schoolyard. <laughs> nor, nor am I. Nor am I think. Nor am I suggesting that universities are. <laughs> yeah, that might be close to the mark. But, yes. <laughs> but but what I am what I am saying is that we're we're seeing a shift from from saying that value is in locking things up, to value is in opening things up, and uh, you know uh, 
I don't think Kevin would have any issue with me saying this, but Kevin and I have had a meeting already and we've dis been discussing this. The, the position that we've always taken with OSGOL is that it's a, a, a national licensing framework for open access to publicly funded information and that includes all sorts of things including uh, publicly funded research and innovation. Um, and if, if we take that view in terms of managing OSGOL, I know my board agrees that uh, you know, we ought to be, um, uh, as, a, as a framework, maintaining a watching brief on what's happening in there and making sure that the framework, in fact, does meet the needs of those that have publicly funded information. And so uh, we're working already uh, with Ken and uh, his uh, group at New South Innovations and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that uh, very soon we'll be uh, applying the easy access IP licences or a a standard derivative that we'll agree upon um, uh, to be uh, part of the OSGOL licensing framework. Um, we see um, this uh, as an important initiative. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, that's right. I just thought we might uh, see uh, whether Catherine uh, Watcho is on the line. She had a question about uh, royalties and um, something about legal terms. Catherine, are you there? Would that be a perhaps? Catherine is yes. Can we hear her, Catherine in the microphone or perhaps I will read her question out? Catherine, can you hear us or can we hear you is the question? Hello, Catherine. <laughs> she can hear us, but we can't. Hi. Oh. Hi. Hello, Hi. Catherine. Yes, uh, what was your question, Catherine? Um, well, the first question is, is is it possible to have a, a view of the one-page agreement? Um, I would understand if you don't want to share. And the other question is when the the, uh, the, the work is shared with a company, if the company develops that product is and there's royalties coming up, is the university having a share of that? Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, to, to answer those in order, if you ping me your email address, I'll be happy to, to get Tim, uh, who's the Easy Access IP project manager, to get in touch to let you see the license because I have absolutely no issue with sharing it at all. Um, okay. It, it, it is a one pager. It's technically one page plus one line. Um, and just so <laughs> you understand that uh, I was told that you had to have a piece of the contract on the same page as the signature box and therefore yeah. the lawyers actually had to make it go over onto the next page so we could fit the signature box onto the second page but no issue with sharing that at all. Um, if the company goes off and develops a product based on our IP and they generate income there is no obligation on them at all to give us anything. Um, what we want is recognition, attribution and, and acknowledgement for our contribution um, but there is no financial obligation on them to give us anything at all. Trust me though, if they go and make a billion dollars, our foundation people will be all over them like a rash looking for buildings to be built or endowments <laughs> or uh, the, the, the moral obligation will be enormous. Um, um, the, the, the reason of my question is because I noticed that some of the um, already available easy access IP on the web are have patents yep. and so I was wondering how you were handling patents if you give it over to a company that must be really interesting. Um, what happens is that initially we give them a three-year license on the patents so they have to to take on all future IP protection costs we don't ask them for backdated IP protection costs. Uh, if they want to keep the patent, they have to fund it. If after three years they can demonstrate they've done something with the IP, at that point I'll assign the patents to them, again free of charge. Okay. Um, may I ask one last question? Sure, go ahead, Catherine. Sure. Um, have you, because they are free, have you ever considered uh, placing them under a Creative Commons license? Um, sort of yes, um, but we've decided that just to 
press ahead with the, the Easy Access IP experiment first, you know, just to see what happens with this uh, one-page license agreement that we've developed. Okay. And that's a that's a question I've asked myself. In fact, is why wouldn't I? Why why would I bother to um, incorporate the Easy Access IP licenses into the Osgol framework when I have a Creative Commons attribution license? I think the answer is this: the Easy Access IP license is really directed towards the movement of IP in towards a patent sphere. Uh, there are specific clauses, and I appreciate you probably haven't seen them yet, that concern specifically patents and patent applications. Um, that's not necessarily uh, the license I would choose if I was simply going to be transferring data around. Uh, but the transfer of data or other materials with a view to making something patentable in some circumstances, I think, requires some of these extra clauses, and that's why we'll be including them into the Osgol framework. Terrific. And the, the other, the, yeah, the other yeah. aspect, of course, is that the default Easy Access IP license is exclusive. Indeed. Hmm. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Catherine. That was very quite thought-provoking. Um, it might be time for us to. Uh, move over to uh, our update from uh, Osgol. Baden, what's been happening since last we met uh, at uh, our last webinar? What's what's new in the world of Osgol at the moment? I'm, um, I'm very glad you asked that question, actually. <laughs> I'm just, it's just unfortunate you've asked that. I've just lost the page in trying to uh, move the webinar uh, thing around my screen. <laughs> I'll just try and grab it. <laughs> uh, All right, let's start with the, the website. Have you, got, have you got anything <laughs> new on the website, Baden? <laughs> strange you ask. We do, in <laughs> fact. Um, look, a, a couple of uh, webinar presentations ago, I think we talked about a survey that we were going to conduct or a, 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 uh, a, uh, I suppose an avenue for you to submit questions about frequently asked questions on data and data licensing uh, with respect to, to research. And so uh, I'm glad to say that it's been now completed and it's available on the Osgol website under the research tab. If you go to www.osgol.gov.au uh, and then you click on the research tab, uh, you'll find two subpages. The first subpage um, concerns the um, uh, the FAQs um, <clears throat> and there's around about 20 I think, 19 or 20 FAQs that we've answered there, um, a majority of them specifically relating to research and research data. There's also now a provision on the site for you to submit further questions that you would like answered. Um, so we only the, asked two Alex things. Has, Alex yep. has got that up on the screen now, the Osgol site. Is that the right spot? Ah, okay, okay, excellent. Yep, so uh, you can see there that if you uh, click on the word form, it will take you to our form and that will lodge your FAQ directly <coughs> to me and others at hands and we'll be notified of your question. Uh, we only ask for your email address just because we may need to contact you directly uh, with a response if you request a direct response. Um, or to obtain further information about your questions so that we could give a more well-rounded answer um, in respect of those FAQs. So, so that was a piece of work. Uh, uh, I think we ticked that off as being done. Um, of course, we're very happy and delighted with the way the uh, uh, licensing webinars have been going. Um, ANS have been able to record onto their YouTube site ANS data. I think is the YouTube address, A-N-D-S-D-A-T-A. -A. Uh, we've taken uh, some shortcuts uh, to the relevant licensing webinars that have been published on there and we've made them available as well under the Osgol Research tab. And uh, this, indeed, this particular webinar is being recorded and it will go up there as soon as Anne's release that as well. So. Uh, 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 up the top of the page, uh, you know, I, I suppose I'd, I'd, it goes without saying, but if you've got anything or anyone you'd like us to uh, include in a webinar on any topic, 
um, let us know. Uh, happy to uh, understand what what other things you'd like to hear about. But um, so those are the two new pieces of information we've got there. Um, now, if I could just try to minimise this on my screen again. Um, uh, how? Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, CC version 4. You're all probably wondering, <coughs> we had Diane Peters here on the last occasion and we haven't seen CC version 4 come out yet and you'd be right. Um, uh, all, all the good things come with time. Um, I understand from speaking with CCHQ uh, this week that they are very, very close to release. Uh, they couldn't give me an actual date or a time, but they, they said they're very, very close. So watch this space. Um, and as soon as they are released, of course, we'll be examining them as we are with the Easy Access IP licence and incorporating them into the OSGOL framework. Um, some announcements from the, from the various governments, if you happen to be dealing with uh, governments as part of research stuff, the uh, Queensland government uh, had their opening the vault day the other day uh, in uh, the Queensland Performing Arts Centre. The message from the Premier there is that open access uh, to IP is, is the way they are going. Um, uh, there is a, an assistant minister that has, has been appointed to ensure that uh, the Queensland government does move towards this way. The Queensland government whole of government IP policy has just been amended to be Osgol centric and we're very pleased to see that. Uh, and so that's the document that will be guiding all of the agencies as they, com as they commence uh, the further work, I suppose, in terms of opening up access to their data. Equally, Victorian government IP principles were released not so long ago. Uh, the guidelines for each of the government departments on how to apply open licences to their material has also just been, um, uh, I suppose, signed off on. It hasn't been published yet, but it has been signed off. Uh, we'll be having uh, copies of all these materials placed up onto the OSGOL website um, uh, when it's reformed, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Western Australia has also now given public endorsement of the OSGOL program and also has uh, changed its whole of government IP policy to reflect that it's uh, now permitting uh, Queen, uh, West Australian public servants to apply OSGOL stuff. We're going to be doing some implementation work with the West Australian government, I'm sure, as the year progresses, so uh, uh, stay tuned and if you are doing any business with any of these agencies and you are uh, interested to know about what licensing is happening, please feel free to give us a call. Um, we are in the process as well of uh, arranging for OSGOL practitioner groups to be uh, commenced in each one of these jurisdictions now that these positions have been taken. Uh, so um, uh, we're, we're looking forward to doing a lot more work there, not only with government but with people who are interacting with government. If you happen to have a very good travel budget, and I know some people in universities like Kevin do have an ex excellent travel budget, there's, there's uh, a couple of international events that are coming up that you may be interested in. On the 4th to the 8th of August in Buenos Aires is the biennial Creative Commons uh, event. Basically everyone who is in Creative Commons leaves Mountain View, California and all their affiliate offices and they head to one spot and that's going to be Buenos Aires uh, uh, this year, again on the 4th, 8th of, uh, of Sounds August. Sounds like a also Creative the Commons open. carnival, is that right? It's going to be a love-in, yes. It's, 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 it's very much uh, the event that they look forward to every couple of years. So, um, uh, and of course, this year there'll be um, a lot to do, I suspect, with the release of the new version for licences. Um, that and a lot of work as, as well that, um, that uh, Creative Commons is doing ancillary to its licensing work. For example, uh, they are leading um, a group called the Open Policy Network, which is effectively a lot of organisations that are custodians of open access policies all around the world. OSGOL is a foundation member of the OPN and uh, we look forward to working with them as that, as that uh, progresses. Um, the other thing too is that uh, October, uh, not Oktoberfest, um, all OK right, so Fest, we're going the Open from, Knowledge we're going Festival. from Carnival <laughs> in uh, Buenos Aires to uh, beer drinking in Germany, is that right? Well, look, who said open licensing was a boring, had to be a really boring exercise? It doesn't have to be. Uh, so Geneva, no, Geneva in, in September, Oktoberfest is what's happening there. Um, 
And uh, the other thing too, uh, part of the Osgo program that we're working on is um, uh, uh, federation of Australia's data portals. Now, a lot of the government uh, uh, jurisdictions are developing data portals. You would have seen data.qld, I suppose, is the most recently released one. We're working to federate all of those data portals together. We've got a large meeting cross-federation happening uh, on the 15th of April, next Monday, in fact. So uh, we'll have more news about what we're going to be doing there after that event. And uh, the other thing, too, is we've now got some, or we're working out some hard figures on, in terms of uh, uh, Cal royalties that are being paid by schools because of access, um, and the, the way that government materials have, have not been licensed openly, I suppose, uh, you could suggest where a government has a website, uh, a department has a website or it has materials that are downloadable from that website and the schools reuse that materials for educational and teaching purposes, they pay a royalty on that. And it's looking at around about three and a half million uh, for just accessing just web pages alone. It's not dealing with um, the downloads uh, from the actual site. So um, <clears throat> we're going to be doing a lot more work with the education sector in, in particular uh, as well where we're looking at um, uh, open educational resource policy. So uh, I hope in a, in a little while to be able to announce a, a, another element to our program that we'll see Osgol in the education uh, a, a figure, I suppose, in the education uh, sector, as well as in government, uh, as well as uh, attaching onto all the work we're doing with the uh, uh, innovation and, and research communities. That's a good fight. I think that's uh, with probably the, about um, it for me for the moment. Yeah, very interesting on the, um, the the copyright fees area. In that, um, I would have thought that across the government systems in Australia, you know, all the different jurisdictions. The different, uh, you know, licensing between levels of government and even within the same government, within the same department, sometimes all that inefficiency of transaction and and actual fees as well uh, would, uh, you know, really justify the existence of Osgol about you know a thousand times, I'd imagine, and, and as far as a uh, an implementation and then a return on investment for the system. So we really hope that one gets some legs, uh, Baden. Well, we've just we've done some back of the back of the pack sort of uh, figures. You know, even if we only save one million dollars uh, to the education sector around the country uh, by um, introducing or, or prosecuting further open licensing in government, then that's the equivalent to five years of operating costs the Osgol program. So yes, and think of if we can save ten million, which is what we're thinking about. It's around about 60 years worth. <laughs> that, that's lots of carnivals and lots of Oktoberfests, actually. But perhaps we could... I won't be going to the extent <laughs> that you yeah. No, no, of course. But uh, put it the other way, you know, that's extra teachers that we could be teaching our kids instead of, you know, paying license fees for, for educational materials. So, you Indeed. know, terrific. Um, I think that's probably as much as we have time for this week. I'll just draw people's uh, this time. The uh, draw your attention to our next licensing webinar, which will be on uh, Thursday, June the 20th, so in a couple of months. Again, if you've got any ideas or things you'd like to hear about, don't uh, hesitate to contact us at ANS. That's probably best uh, services at ANS, or you can contact uh, Osgol as well. Uh, there's other webinars as well. If you uh, have other interests, we've got uh, a thing coming up on ORCID, which is uh, identifying researchers across information systems through uh, uh, sort of global identifiers. So ORCID, that's on April the 23rd. And we've got an interesting uh, data citation uh, series of uh, webinars coming up. So there's a a kind of uh, data citation 101 webinar on Tuesday, April the 30th. Best if you go to ans.org.au slash events to have a look at that or just go to the ANS website and follow the easy to find uh, ANS events uh, tab there. We um, have a, quite a set of uh, different webinars coming through there and as I said, very keen to get your input if you've got uh, any other ideas Kevin, thank you so much for that um, really 
inspiring uh, technology transfer view. It really My uh, pleasure. It's just the way you've turned things on the head there, just absolutely amazing. If people want to get in contact with you, uh, Kevin, or to um, find out more about that, what, what would be the best? Uh, the email address, it's on the final slide. Okay. So, okay. Good, good. K.Cullen at nsinnovations.com.au. Okay, and uh, is there a website that uh, is your home for, um, for innovations? We have that up on the screen, aren't we? Efficient nsinnovations.com.au terrific that's the one that's the one um, and Baden where do we follow you where's the best place to follow your your um, progress in uh, Osgol at Osgol on Twitter is probably the uh, most up to date one terrific uh, we've got uh, one thing I didn't mention is we're, we're about to embark upon a large scale uh, rebuild of our website and we're going to be having jurisdictional pages um, so each government uh, jurisdiction will have its own page on Osgold. You'll be able to access all the appropriate policy documents that are there that the government departments ought to be uh, uh, operating under. And as well, we are about to produce a, uh, a data set that will be published on the website that will indicate all the government departments and uh, whether they are openly licensed at this point in time or not. Uh, and any other relevant matters that we um, we point out about the uh, copyright status of their materials. Terrific. All right, thank you very much. And thanks to our, our great um, audience. The uh, participation was terrific today. We've got some great uh, questions there. Um, it's uh, much appreciated. All right, well, so um, uh, we'll see you at our next uh, webinar. Licensing is in uh, on June the 20th. Thanks very much, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ta-da. Thank you. Bye.